beautiful. I apologize, I got so caught up in the resurrection power that I forgot to do the procession. John <laughs> <laughs> Beck looked at me and he went, and I just I thought, what's wrong? What's wrong? <laughs> You're wrong. You're supposed to be the person. Oh, right. <laughs> oh, it's a great day, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Will you pray with me, please? Wondrous, amazing God. How grateful we are for this day that shines with life, <coughs> that crackles with the energy of the resurrection. How grateful we are, God, for all of the blessings that you share with us and for the gift of life itself. God, we are so thankful that you are real, that you want us to be real with you. That, God, you're not looking for platitudes or mindless worship or obligation. That, God, what you want is our hearts in whatever state they are in this day. So God, with whatever we bring in our hearts today, whether it is pain or joy, whether it is anger or contentment, whether it is peace or anxiety, God, remind us that you want all of who we are and you ask that we hold nothing back during this time. Because you don't hold back from us, God. You offer all of your love to us all of the time. God, help us to receive that love now through your word. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts bring great healing to each one of us here and to our world. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to the Universal Studios tour of Easter this morning. <laughs> because this is the Gospel of Matthew, and Matthew's account of the resurrection is full of more special effects than you can shake a stick at, as my dad used to say. Before I go any farther, though, I just have to say, I love this picture. Oh, it's 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 awesome. Awesome. <laughs> so there were no flying lambs in this account of the resurrection. But there was just about everything else. There was an earthquake shaking everyone to their core. It changed the shape of everything. There were pyrotechnics and fireworks in the shape of an angel who was so bright. Scripture says the angel descended from above like lightning. And that angel was apparently, had been working out quite a bit, because he just took that boulder and <laughs> tossed it right away from the tomb. <laughs> and then for those of you interested in such things, there were the big buff Roman soldiers. <laughs> And of course, though, the biggest special effect of all was God's special effect, because that tomb was empty. Jesus was no longer there. The angel says, he is risen from the dead, and he is waiting for you. It's pretty exciting stuff, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's got a lot of flash to it. Maybe it's a little too exciting. Maybe a little too exciting, especially for our 2014 minds that are pretty skeptical. And if you're here today and you're asking, Really? <laughs> really? Did it happen that way? Like that? For real? Or maybe you might even be asking, did it really happen at all? If you're asking those questions, you probably aren't alone. After all, even the gospel writers tell vastly different versions of the resurrection story. All four of the writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all tell the story of the resurrection, but they all tell it differently. For instance, the Gospel of Matthew that we heard today, the only one that mentions an earthquake. Matthew and Luke, they're the only ones with an angel that looks like lightning. In the Gospels of Luke and John, they describe that there are two messengers, two angels. But in Matthew and Mark, we only get one. Matthew is the only one with the hunky yet terrified soldiers. <laughs> and in Mark and Luke, the stone is already moved away when the women arrive. But Matthew tells us that the angel moved the stone away after the women arrived. I'm telling you, the details, they are all over the map. 
if you look at all four accounts. So if you're here today questioning this whole resurrection business, it's perfectly understandable. It's okay to question. It is okay to doubt. Doubt really is at the very heart of faith, despite what many would say. The Apostle Paul said it. He said, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Not faith is the substance of things you can see right in front of your face. Right. <laughs> he says, faith is the evidence of things not seen. Not the evidence of things that you can't see. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite quotes by Henry David Thoreau, he says, faith keeps many doubts in her pay. If I could not doubt, I should not believe. Our modern-day writer, Brene Brown, says, faith minus vulnerability equals extremism. Yes. Mm -hmm. Anyone familiar with that one? Yeah. Yeah. She says, if you've got all the answers, then don't call what you do faith. Yes. Christian faith. Faith in God is rarely so much about having the right answers as it is about daring to ask questions. Even... It's okay to ask questions even when we are in the very act of showing up at the tomb on Easter morning because you can bet when Mary Magdalene and that other Mary. Man, wouldn't you hate to go through history and be known as that other Mary? <laughs> <laughs> well, when the two Marys, when they showed up at the tomb, you can bet they had questions. And I'll bet the first one was, why? Why? Why, God, didn't you stop what happened? Why did he have to die so violently? Why did he have to die at all? Why did we have to be crushed by this grief? Why? They came to the tomb, no doubt, with these questions. And the angel didn't say to them, well, stop it. Don't you have any faith? The angel just said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. We don't have to be afraid to question. God is way more than big enough for any question that we have. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. While we may question the details, how it happened, what exactly happened, who was there, which gospel writer got it right, even whether or not it actually happened, while we're asking all those questions, it is so important to realize this. That this story, this event, no matter what or what did not occur, is still absolutely, positively true. Yes. Amen. And here's what I mean by that. There's a Native American saying that goes like this. I don't know if the story I'm about to tell you happened exactly like this or not, but I know that the story is true. There is a truth at the core of the story that is unshakable. No matter how the resurrection happened then, no matter how it happens now, the core truth is that in God's dominion, death never, ever, ever has the last word. Yes. Death never has the final victory. Violence, greed, hatred, bigotry, Depression, despair, injustice, suffering. Never do any of these ever have the last word. Do you believe me? Mm -hmm. yes. It's okay to say, I'm not sure. Jesus had been trying to get this message across throughout all of his ministry. That resurrection on that first Easter... That was not his first display of resurrection power or resurrection wisdom. If you take a look at the Gospel of John, way before the crucifixion in chapter 12, he says, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus knew Especially, he knew, as a first century Jew living in Roman-occupied territory. He knew that death was everywhere. He knew that for the people he loved and was trying to teach and lead, he knew that their experience of death was constant. 
Death not just of the body, but death of the spirit in the way that injustice and poverty can kill you bit by bit, day by day. It's a tiny bit like death by a million paper cuts. Sometimes death is forced upon us. Sometimes it just happens. But death is never, ever the end in God's dominion. It is just not in God's plan. Mm -hmm. And Jesus taught this in so many ways. He addressed in his teachings and in his interactions with people, he addressed all the ways that death comes. He talked about how it happens when we bring it on ourselves. You remember the prodigal son? Made a lot of really bad choices. Until he ended up and he hit bottom. He could not get any lower. And he thought his life was over. But he thought, I'll go back home and see if they'll at least let me have something to eat there while I feed the pigs. And he went home. And what did he find there? Was it shame? No. Was it rejection? No. Was it judgment? No. Was it resurrection? Yes. All right. These folks over here are winning. Come on. Guys. <laughs> He didn't find judgment or rejection or damnation or hell. He found resurrection and an unconditional welcome. Jesus told that story for a purpose. He healed people when they were dying in bits and bits and bits in their bodies and in their minds. He touched and healed people who had been ill since birth. He touched and raised the, the people who actually were dead like Lazarus. He did it to show over and over and over again, death isn't the end. What God does is the end. Yes. And what God does is life. Mm -hmm. All right. And he talked to them about what you do when death is forced upon you because of your color or your socioeconomic status or your gender or your sexual orientation or your age or any number of things in this world that are kept confined in the tombs of death. He said to all of those people, he said, blessed are you who mourn, for you will be comforted. Mm -hmm. Blessed are you who are poor now, because in God's dominion, you will own it. Blessed are you who hunger and thirst after justice and righteousness. You will be satisfied. Hunger and thirst, satisfied. Mm -hmm. Poverty, owning God's dominion. Mm -hmm. Illness and brokenness and death. Salvation and wholeness. Mm -hmm. This is what Jesus was trying to teach his whole life until he finally gave us the biggest, most ultimate example there could ever be. Because he wanted to say once and for all, this is what is true. No matter where you or I are in our lives, Right now, no matter what we believe or don't we believe, God is a God of hope reborn, of life meant to be lived fully, of death defeated forever. That is why this story is true, no matter what the facts are. Mm -hmm. But here's the deal. I can already hear the voices out there. Oh, I knew it. There's always a catch. <laughs> You preacher types, there's always a catch. Here it is. If we want to get the full-on impact of this truth that Jesus taught with every fiber of his being, if we want to get the full-on impact and experience of the resurrection, we have to be willing to go where God is. Now, it is true that God is always with us. That is the one thing that is promised us in Scripture. But this is also true. God goes up ahead of us. Yes. God is always up ahead. The angel said to the Marys, Go and tell the other disciples, 
Jesus has gone ahead of you to Galilee. Go and you will find him there. God does not hang out in the tombs of our lives. We might hang out there. <laughs> it's not where God hangs. God is outside the tomb. God does not remain with our regrets and our pain and those memories of things that have been done to us, those memories of things and ways we have hurt others, all those things we hate to think about. That's the tomb and God is not there no matter how much we force ourselves to stay. God is ahead of us waiting for us saying, look, I'm right here, I'm up here. Come, join me. Meet me in Galilee. And then go and tell the others who are stuck in their tomb. Go and tell them yes. that I'm waiting for them too. Yes. Where is your Galilee this morning? Mm -hmm. Where is my Galilee? What does it look like? I'm kind of guessing it doesn't look like the desert of Palestine. Mm -hmm. Especially not here in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> Where is Jesus waiting for you? Where is the resurrection power of God that cannot be contained in that tomb any longer? Where is it waiting for you to come and find out for yourself that the tomb was never meant to contain you either? Yes. What does your Galilee look like? Maybe it looks like AA. Alcoholics Anonymous. Or NA, Narcotics Anonymous. If so, we've got a great AA meeting, Monday nights, 7 o'clock, right here. Awesome meeting. Come and check it out. Jesus is waiting for you there. Yes. Maybe your Galilee looks like going back home to visit because there's a conversation waiting for you there that will lead to the resurrection of love. Perhaps your Galilee is giving yourself over to that grief over that person you lost. It may seem like it's odd to talk about grief on Easter Sunday, but it's not. Because guess what? It is the key to resurrection. Right. Feeling it is the key. Maybe your Galilee is finally letting yourself cry and rage so that stone that used to be your heart finally rolls away so that the life can come emerging out. Maybe Jesus is waiting for you in your Galilee called coming out whether it's about your gender, or your sexual orientation, or your HIV status, or your past, or your dreams for your future, or your longings right now. Whatever it is you need to share so you can find out you are not alone. If you want a surefire experience of the resurrection, finding God's love through community is a great way yeah. to experience Galilee. Maybe your Galilee just might be this church. Amen. Or, at the least, a willingness to take a chance on God one more time. To realize that the pain you may have suffered being crucified by those in another church who just didn't know what they were doing. Come on. To understand that it's over. Yes. It's done. Yes. It is finished. Amen. It is finished. That was then and this is now. And right here, this is Galilee. Amen. This is Amen. it. Yeah. Jesus is waiting for us all right here with whatever we bring, with whatever we need to be able to be fully alive and discover resurrection. Jesus is right here saying, see, I told you. Death and violence, even spiritual violence, never have the last word. Now come out and rise up with me. That's what today is all about. If we go from this place this day and think, oh, that was, I'm so glad that Jesus didn't have to experience that. Jesus didn't experience it so he could go through it. Mm. Jesus went through it so that we could be resurrected. Amen. And if you're saying right now, I can't. I can't do any of those things. I'm afraid. I can't go to AA. I'm afraid. I can't disclose my HIV status. I'm afraid. 
I can't be vulnerable. It's safe here in the tomb. It's a little lonely, a little cold, but it's safe. If you are saying that today, it's okay, because you can bet that the Marys were afraid too. We know this because Matthew tells us that. It says after the angel sent them forth, it says they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy. Fear and great joy. It's quite a combo, isn't it? <laughs> Let us never forget, no matter how many questions we ask, that it was in their fear and great joy together that they found Jesus. Brene Brown says again, daring greatly is being brave and afraid every minute of the day at the exact same time. <laughs> daring greatly is being brave and afraid every minute of the day at the exact same time. And this is what Easter is all about. It's about daring greatly in the midst of our fear and in the midst of our joy. Daring to believe that God really has taken care of them. That it's not going to have the last word in our lives. Do you believe that today? Amen. Yes. yes. Are you sure? Yes. I don't want anyone to leave here thinking they have to stay in the tomb. Yes. That is not God's will for anyone's life, ever. Mm -hmm. Ever. And if you need help coming out of yours, if you need help on your road to Galilee, then here we are.